we we go live. Yeah, for sure. I think I think the the problem is when you're in a role for so long, you don't you take what you know for granted and you take what you've achieved for granted because you don't have yes. that, um that perspective and context for what else is happening around the world. Totally. So you think oh like what I'm doing here in in South Africa like design systems at scale is not easy. So yeah, it was, but, but yeah, I mean, off the back of that conversation, I just, I, I'd taken some time to really think about where I was, what I wanted, that kind of stuff. And I had a discussion with leadership in NetBank to say, look, I'm not really happy with how things have like, because there was a whole bunch of restructured stuff and whatever that happened the, the last year when I joined and I moved into a new team and our team was merged with another team and run by someone else. And it was a different department. So it was right. just conflicting sort of interests and, and directions. Um, and yeah, I think through that process, it was just realizing, okay, there's actually something that I want in my career and my future. I've kind of been going through the motions because I've been at you know NetBank for five years. Um, and then yeah, Dubai reached out, Omnia reached out, and they were like, hey, we've found you on LinkedIn. You seem to be the the design system guy. Can we have some chats? So I was like, cool, but we're not moving. And they're like, you don't have to. I was like, okay. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think I think going through that IKEA journey actually made you realize that yeah, it's better to be upfront than to go through this whole process and then in the end you have to decline because you have to be there, you know. It was yeah, it was a yeah. good learning experience. Sorry, just uh, yeah, work work doesn't stop. <laughs> no worries at all. So waiting for people to join. Yeah, all good. Let me, see. Let me open it on my iPad. Yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah, last time, uh, the first time I did it, I noticed there is like like almost five second delay, plus minus. Yeah. Yeah, so when I got into that discussion with the guys from Dubai, it was basically, okay, obviously it's not the same organization and product sort of team as Ikea. I mean, like I said to Carolina, like the Ikea role is like, it's physical design system product and then digital design system product for a physical design system product. It's like, it's like the dream job. Um, <laughs> and also like the, just yeah, the people. I'd love you to, un to un actually unpack that a little. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. So I, I see people are joining. Awesome. Welcome One, everyone. Uh, LinkedIn user said, hi, Batsy. Just as LinkedIn user, which is odd. Hey, Sorry if I'm not looking directly at the camera. It's a weird setup. Yeah, I will not be doing that either. I remember <laughs> seeing uh, a gadget on Shark Tank. Or they, they invented this thing where it puts the camera on the screen itself. Uh, this little swivel thing that you attach. So you, you're always looking directly at the thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Did you watch the the latest WWDC announcement? Apple announcement. Yes, which um, which, which I didn't watch the whole thing. I watched like uh, Marquez Brownlee's. <laughs> so, so they've they've included um, webcam support for iPhones with an attachment for the top of your Mac or screen or whatever. Oh, okay. and that's why I think my Logitech camera doesn't work because I think they've stopped it in the OS. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Typical Apple. You need to check that out. Cool. I think we can get rolling. Yeah, awesome. So Makarios says, thank you so much for the great initiative. It's totally our pleasure. Absolutely our pleasure. So let me introduce Andrew a little bit. Um, I will do like a five-second intro, and then he can talk about himself. 
So met Andrew on LinkedIn, saw that he's a design systems guy. We hooked up because of, we had that in common. Um, and he recently landed a job in Dubai, which I thought was amazing because I get a lot of people back home, whether it's South Africa or Zimbabwe, asking about how they can actually get noticed on the global design uh, stage. Because we all know design, whether it's UI or UX or product, it's all really hot right now. There's a lot of companies hiring. Um, so how do you get noticed within that context, right? So yeah, Andrew's done that and we would kind of love to hear his story and how he, he got into it. So once we get to this uh, question section, I think what we want to focus on today is design systems as well as, like I said, getting hired and, and recruitment and how do you get noticed as a designer. Over to you, Andrew, tell us about yourself. Uh, my favorite thing talking about myself. <laughs> no pressure, um, not an interview. Well, but yeah, actually, I actually think that we have met in person. Um, so you, were, you worked at Wonderman, didn't you? I did. Oh yeah, we were together at, um, but if, if we did, because I, I only worked in, in that department for like three months or so. Yeah, so I, I don't think, like we never worked together. So I used to work for Applogix back in the day with Jared, Christian, oh, and Mark. Okay. But I, I used to I used to come for drinks on Friday. Um, oh, okay. Often, and I think we actually did bump into each other in your brief stint. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very possible. <laughs> so that's actually how I was put onto you in terms of Dubai because I asked Christian if he knows yes. anyone at Omnia and he said, reach out to Batsy. If, he, if anyone knows, he'll know. <laughs> so that's why I reached out to you. Nice. Yeah, Christian is a stand-up guy. Love him. Yeah, he, he, I actually chatted to him yesterday morning. He called me on his way to uh, work in London because he's moved to London. I don't know if you know. Yes, a while ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool to, to see how the network stays connected. Um, and that's, yeah, I mean, we'll get into that just now, but maybe a brief history about me. Um, yeah, so I'm in South Africa, Joburg based. Um, I went overseas for uh, Friday drinks. Yep. Agency life. <laughs> um, we, uh, the, the only benefits that uh, agencies offer. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> well, that and the ping pong table. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so I went over to Australia to study worship and creative arts in 2007 to 2009. Um, realized that that wasn't the the life goals for me, uh, where what I was going to be pursuing. So I came back to South Africa and basically I had, yeah, I'd given up everything to go over. So I came back to nothing like a zero, zero bank balance, no car, no, no degree. Um, I stopped my BCom to go over there, um, but came back and long story short, fell into sort of post-production print design, um, um, well, photography, um, DP, DP work for, for a brand called Rage. So I did a lot of their, post-production stuff for a lot of the, the in-store um, activations. So those massive billboards and stuff. Basically I had to teach myself in design pretty quickly. So I, I hate that program. Don't ever want to go back there. I, I love in design. <laughs> in design is great for, for its purpose, for but books. it's yeah, yeah, yeah. in terms of from, from the Adobe suite, if you want to self teach yourself anything, don't, 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 don't try and learn in design. Um, but then through that work, I got some other like freelance work. Um, I ended up doing uh, FIFA Beach Soccer when they came to South Africa, all of their, all of their design work, um, which was pretty cool. Um, and then landed a, a sort of front-end design job, a uh, web design job for a, an NGO called Heartlines. Um, and they then required someone to, to upskill on the front-end side in terms of web dev. Um, and I was put on loan out to the agency assisting them and was kind of given a, a computer and internet access and access to source files and like, go and figure this stuff out for yourself. So I was literally like inspecting pages, checking wow. code, changing stuff. Okay, that's what a div is. That's what a P tag is. Literally teaching myself from scratch. So um, I, any coding background? No. No, so I mean, I've, I've always been around computers my whole life um like my dad was in telecommunications my my uncle was um in like network infrastructure um PABX, right. all that kind of stuff so quite technical um and i'd always played around with like photoshop and flash and like i'd messed around with stuff all the time um so i'd had an understanding of how software worked at least um but yeah I've kind of fell in love with front-end dev um pretty pretty rapidly um just you know, I obviously love design, um, but for me, like 
bringing design to life in terms of interaction it was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, and so then basically, so what is that? You still do some front end development? So funny enough, from that point, I kind of moved into front end. Uh, I, I didn't oh. focus on design at all. Um, also for our projects, you did front end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, was yeah. it JavaScript or? Yeah, so so basically my, my role there at, at Heartline shifted. I, I, I kind of got close to Christian and the AppLogix guys because they were the technical partner. And I said to Christian, I actually want to work for you guys. And he was like, well, we can't really steal you from the client because that would be really bad. Um, that and sounds exactly that, like Christian. <laughs> and then the NGO lost like a bit of funding. Um, so I went to Christian and I said, hey, this is a great opportunity. Tell these guys that you'll take me off their hands. It's going to reduce their cost, <laughs> but I'll still be on their project. Um, and that's what we did. Um, so, yeah, I joined as, as a junior front end um, and then upskilled um, basically with another guy. Um, that was around the time where like responsive web was the, the thing. Um, and I became the responsive web guy. Um, and I specialized in that for quite a while. I actually helped Discovery uh, build their first responsive site. Um, with the media people, right? Yep. So <laughs> it's funny. There's there's still some like responsive widgets that are built that are like lurking in that in that platform. It's amazing. Wow. Um, but yeah, then um, yeah, move from there to to ENCA, help them rebuild their whole front end uh, with a team there. Then move to a startup where we built um, uh, applications for influencer marketing. Um, so basically, connecting influencers um, through to brands. So we built like a, a an influencer match like um, framework um, or engine, should I say? One of the things that I built was um, using IBM Watson and basically taking like human like analysis from people's posts and their writing style and their post style and stuff, and creating sort of a, a personality like matrix, and then linking that to brands with the same values and sent sentiments and their brand values, and saying, "Hey, wow. you should work with these influencers because they're actually yeah. the same as you." Um, but yeah, startup world is is fun. Um, it's crazy, but uh, finances are always an issue. So it got to a point where it wasn't financially viable for for me to stay on. Um, and then I joined a consultancy called Free Thinking in South Africa, um, and basically went straight into NetBank. Um, and my first task was, okay. "Do you know about design systems? Because I think this bank's going to need one. So best you learn wow. and build one." Wow. And that's kind of that was. It was five years ago, five and a half years ago. So 2017, 2017, I think, April 2017. And um, what yeah. technologies were they building their software on? Like, was it the app and online banking or? So, like so I joined when right. NetBank kind of started their, their internal digital team. Um, so they'd been outsourcing everything. Um, and they hadn't really, they were quite far behind in terms of digital uptake, um, especially behind the other banks. Um, so the, the mandate was kind of like, um, yeah, we've got 1,200 services in the bank that you need to digitize. We need to digitize. Uh -huh. um, and when, when I joined, there were five people in digital um, at NetBank. Uh, when I left now, a month and a half ago, two months ago, there were 156 designers um, in digital. Designers? UX and UI, yeah. Wow, that's incredible. And all in-house? All in-house. Oh, uh, so, uh, there were some contractors, but I'd say about okay, yeah, it's always like a high yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh wow, that's incredible. So yeah, it's uh, it grew to be quite a big team. Um, yeah, and when I joined, it was you know the the design system was a, a hidden project, a very quiet project. It was like we're not going to tell anyone that this exists because we don't we're not going to get funding for it. People don't understand what it is. Um, but yeah. the creative director at the time, who yeah, it was revolutionary. Yeah, we, we won't go down that road, but he did some great things. He did some not so great things, but one of the great things was he like, I recognize that a design system is going to be important for this organization. Um, so yeah, it was myself and another guy and a floating designer on the design system. Um, so we were front end engineers trying to build the system. And the mandate was, uh, yeah, don't use any frameworks, don't reuse anything, build it from scratch. So we built wow. a JavaScript uh, engine that basically yeah, took the components and displayed them into, you know, uh, a usable way for all of our users and designers. But we actually built a system and not the design system, the, the stuff that goes into it, right? We built basically 
Envision Design System Manager um, in, in JavaScript, which was, we learned a lot, which was great. Um, but yeah, long story short, we went through six or seven iterations of that. We moved to a framework called Fractal that handled a lot of the, the component stuff. We were able to focus a lot on the design and specifically the UX um, and the research. Um, we spent about a year going around to every uh, digital feature team um, and asking, like working out like what works for them, what doesn't work for them, what components are they using, how are they designing, how are they working, what are their workflows, um, and basically built out a UX framework around NetBank design um and an ethos of what netbank design is who they are why they do what they do and how they do what they do um, and then started to break that down into sort of componentry how components work how templates work why the grid why icons why illustrations why certain style of illustration how to apply those illustrations so we basically built a, a design guideline for for designers to be onboarded pretty rapidly in terms of how netbank do what they do from a design perspective um, and then built out a very robust um, design library in, in Sketch that supported yeah, 156 designers um, across the organization, uh, which was yeah awesome. Um, and sort of the, the goal was, I mean, just after we started this project, the bank was kind of between this React versus um, Angular conversation. Um, and we, we hope we React decided, won that. Well. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> Ang Angular is actually pretty amazing, um, but they chose Angular pretty much because of a resource issue in South Africa. So there were way more yeah. Angular resources I was, I was than say the same thing here. Actually, MSMBD like, had that choice uh, where I used yeah. to work, and Angular won purely because you had more Angular developers than React developers. Yeah, totally. And look, I mean, they're both great. Um, they both function pretty much the same way. Um, they both have pros and cons like anything else. Um, and yeah, so the when we started building out the technology side of, of the design system, it was uh, up in the air still, like, are we going React? Are we going Angular? So I made the decision to keep it tech agnostic, which is pretty good uh, decision, if, if I don't say so myself. So just HTML, CSS, and presentational JavaScript, um, which we then handed over to squads eventually to build out their own components where right. the thought process was we would, well, we, someone would consume those components back into a library that would then be consumed by other teams, but no one was ever mandated to do that. Um, our team didn't have the capacity to do that. So it's, uh, yeah, it became a bit of a dog show in terms of production technical environment where from a design perspective, we were super aligned, super lean, um, there was no rework. The library was serv serving everyone. Um, there wasn't a lot of rework, but on the dev side, like UI wise and alignment wise, it was good because everyone was kind of building from what we had built, but wow. there were still 30 different versions of Angular components for the same thing because no one was really yeah. sharing code bases. Different yeah. teams were working in different versions of Angular, different yeah. methodology. So got to a point where we said, okay, look, we, we, as a team, we can help but we can't keep building and maintaining the system. So that's when we looked at moving to Envision DSM um, and basically ran a crazy pilot, showed them that it was very broken, helped them fix it. And then once it was at a point where we were happy, we, we migrated across to uh, DSM. And that allowed us as a technical team to sort of upskill on the Angular side. And then we basically started to take all of our components and build them into an Angular component library, package them into a node package module, um, and then distribute it to the organization. End of last year, we released the, the first version. So yeah, that was like 74 components with variations and like alternates okay. and stuff. Um, and yeah, on, it was super lean on the front end. Literally the devs just had to link it in their, their, their project. Um, they would reference a UI element, so UI date picker, and then they would have like basically a bunch of options that they could use, turn on and off, and then they had like data inputs that we had already built in the back end of the component. And they just had to basically tie it into to the, the, the data side on their side. That's incredible. So what I love about everything you're saying is I feel like there's a, a, a misconception when it comes to design systems that it's, it's design led, right? And I've always said, I guess, the problem is the name itself, right? It's design systems. So every time you're trying to, to, to introduce design systems in an organization, it's always design led and there's not enough focus on the code. 
Yeah. Um, and I love that you're probably one of the first design systems leads who are more technically focused than design focused, right? Because you hear a lot of the times, if you ask a designer, what's a design system? They always say, oh, it's components and Figma or Sketch and like colors and typography styles and whatever. Maybe, maybe they'll mention design tokens, right? But yeah. there's not enough focus on the actual technology, which is what I love about you is that's exactly what you bring to the table. Um, yeah, so I think it's, like one of the the benefits of the sort of how my career has kind of naturally progressed is like I have a design background. I'm not a designer right now. I wouldn't call myself a designer. Um, I'm more a design-led technologist. Um, so yes. I appreciate technology. I appreciate front end. I'm passionate about front end. Um, so like I'm I'm pretty nerdy when it comes to things like CSS and what CSS can do and the latest properties, yeah. latest trends. Um, like I, I'm one of those people that understands that you can just be a CSS dev. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> I've seen so, so many YouTube videos, like people doing crazy things in CSS, like yeah, modeling crazy. entire like physics engines in CSS. It's crazy. Totally. Um, so yeah, it's, that's the problem, right? So like you're saying, design systems, the word design, people immediately have an idea of, of what it is and what it should be. Um, and I actually ran a, a masterclass at NetBank last year uh, throughout the year to kind of teach people the end-to-end -end process of what a design system like should be. Um, and without the technology side, it's not a system. It's just a design something. So you, have, <laughs> yeah. you have a design library. Um, yeah. You have a UI kit. You have yeah. some UI guidelines or principles, some documentation. But without, if, if, if your component in Figma is not represented in production code through a system, it's not a design system. Amen to that, amen to that. So we've got a question here. What's your take on Envision DSM now? Is this a tool you would recommend to teams? Uh, sorry, I'm just trying. Can you still hear me? I can hear you, but we My can't see you. My camera is doing some crazy things. I don't know why. One second. Maybe my camera just turned off. Sorry, guys. No worries. Second. Um, I'll try and talk while I try and figure this out. Um, it's funny because of the delay. You're on LinkedIn. You're still live. We can still hear, see you talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I don't know why. I think maybe my camera just like shut off on its own. Um, so yeah, Envision. If it comes back, we'll we'll do it. Okay. But cool. yeah, uh, go ahead. Envision DSM. What is your take? Yeah. So DSM is it's a great tool for what it what it offers, right? Um, and it's the this is the case with like any tool chain. I mean, we have this had this discussion often at NetBank. Is you know, just before I left in, um, a couple of months ago, we were at the, this conversation. We'd been sketch led from a design tool perspective for quite a while um, you know obviously Figma is great it offers a lot it offers a lot more than Sketch but Sketch worked for NetBank at the time so the you always have to weigh up okay what's what's the best for us right now do we need to change what's that what's the cost of the change um, what's the what's the impact um, I mean moving everyone from Sketch to Figma is a big thing yeah especially considering that we were tied into Envision and DSM right Exactly. So moving DSM away from uh, support Figma. Um, so it does. Um, people don't know that. Um, they've, they've worked on that. It just doesn't support it as well as Sketch. Okay. Um, what, what I love about Envision DSM is it takes, it takes the thinking away from the system, right? Um, yeah. It's once, like, I mean, we, we were so caught up before when we built our own system about the design of the system. So how the system looks like the colors, the, the interaction, the, so we spend so much time worrying about like what people interacted with rather than the actual work that goes into that system. Um, right. And from a design system perspective, like I will always choose something now, a framework that's as lean as possible that achieves the goal of getting components, documentation, um, links to technical imported components um, for our teams because the system and the framework doesn't actually matter. So yeah, uh, Envision DSM definitely has its space. 
Um, I don't know the longevity of it, um, to be honest. I don't think it's going to scale from what it offers now, but right now it offers quite a lot. Um, it's a place to yeah. kind of park design documentation and te technical front end components, um, which serves its purpose. I don't think it needs to do more than that. Amazing. We've got something from Fadzi. So he's saying that he was today's old, today years old, when you learned the importance of code and design systems. So I think maybe yeah. let's unpack that a little, because I think it's, it is a, something that people aren't that familiar with, like the, just the importance of um, having technical people within the design team. Um, so what would you say, what advice would you give design teams? Oh, we can see you back. <laughs> so what advice would you give design teams that don't have developers or like front end wizards in their squads? And kind of what justification do you think they can use to get the business to fund that initiative? Because I know totally. it might be a budget issue, right? Yeah, so it's it's a tough one, right? Because the this, and this is something that I am super passionate about is breaking the divide between design and, and engineering or dev, right? Yeah. Um, we're one team. Um, and specifically from a design system perspective, like how's a designer going to be designing components and a system and a framework without understanding the technical implications of that from a front end browser perspective or app perspective, and then a technical stack, like, like perspective. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm a massive advocate for every design team should have a front end engineer. And I'm not saying a developer, I'm saying a front end engineer, someone who is passionate about front end, they understand the value of design and the implications of design in technology. Yeah. Um, those people are not easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, the way you say it, that I, I, I want that person in my team because I get it's it's a question that I asked. I think we might have. Yeah, no, I'm still here. Yeah, I oh. think it's just my, my camera's being. <laughs> and the frame it chose to, yeah. Yeah. I was, was gonna bad. say like. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say the, what I feel is lacking in, in a lot of front end teams is front end people who are passionate, about the craft of front end. If you know what I mean, like that attention to detail. Think. Some designers have where you're there's a term in design called pixel perfect, yeah, right. And I don't know if there's an equivalent term in front engine engineering where you are pixel perfect with the code you write. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, maybe you maybe write. not pixel perfect. I mean, it's technically the same thing, right? Um, you, you want a front a, a decent front end engineer is gonna appreciate and respect the design, so you know, they're not gonna for lack of a, a, a better phrase, they're not going to half-ass it, right? It's not going to be like, well, it's functional. <laughs> um, the border radius is, is three, not five, it's but it's, five. it's still there. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I might say some uh, unpopular things today, but there are a lot of front-end developers that aren't front-end developers. Like, just because you can build okay. components in Angular doesn't mean that you're a front-end developer. Um, and the so problem is... How would you define a a front-end developer then? What characteristics would that person, should that person have? Um, so again, I think it starts with design, um, the appreciation for and of design. Um, they should have an understanding of design tools and how design tools work. Um, I'm not saying they have to be a designer, um, though, yeah, I mean, both of the engineers on my previous team came from design and moved to front-end. Um, okay. I'm not saying that that's the trend that it has to be, but generally a solid front-end engineer or design front-end designer um, has some sort of design experience. Um, and, you know, the opposite happens as well. Some really great product and interface designers have front-end experience. Um, and I would highly recommend that every designer spend some time researching front end you don't have to know how to code but understand what css is what it offers what html does what javascript can do what it should do what it shouldn't do the differences between react and and, and angular, angular. Um, yeah and and what those frameworks actually are and where they came from like why do they exist 
Like they, they're yeah. not just there for nothing. Um, yeah. And the problem is with, I mean, when you're talking about JavaScript framework specifically, you know, that whole move around removing the quote unquote backend developer was great in theory, but it's, yeah, to, to be a really good Angular developer, like through and through, you have to be back end and front end. Um, and the problem is it's, that's really hard to do. Like to be that's really true. good at both is, is yeah. difficult. Yeah. And that's where, and that's where it was, you know, we, we had, Net, when I was at NetBank, it was a case of, okay, the design system engineers are front end Angular developers. We're not heavy lifters in the back end in terms of the server side connections and the databases and stuff, but we right. will build amazing UI components in Angular. And amazing we will hand it over. Yeah. And we will hand it over to back end Angular developers to add it into the, the product cycle. Um, right. And I, I think that's a great way to kind of approach things. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's really difficult these days because I mean, for so long in the market, you know, all these companies and all these teams have been looking for, you know, the the unicorns, the full stack developer. I hate that term every time I yeah, say yeah. that. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I, I kind of see if, if someone asked me for a full stack developer, like the kind of person that I think they should be looking for is the equivalent of a like product designer. So someone who understands quite a lot about design, but they still need to be specialist in something, um, yes. in my opinion. Um, so yeah. you want someone who understands back end and systems, but they are more specialist on the front end, or you want someone who understands front end and systems, but are more specialist in the back end. Amazing. So we've got a question here, Makarios. He asks, how do you build design tokens? and document them for the devs? This is a, a very good question. It's like a call on its own, right? <laughs> um, right yes, I'm right. So, so it's, it's pretty simple, actually. Um, again, the problem here is the word design. I just call them tokens because tokens are a <laughs> middle way layer, right? So yeah. design tokens, are, they impact design, right? You build them in design, but when when it's built into a design system those tokens become agnostic of design and dev they become a middle layer that serves yeah. both design and dev so yeah. front end is set up i mean front end has been built like this for a very long way like a long time where your css is structured in a way that you have a variables folder that all of your components read from so you have your high level variables which are technically design tokens so i'm just saying we were there first <laughs> um, <laughs> But variables have been there since the dawn of time. So exactly. I'm always like wary of calling design tokens variables because I, yep. I know. Yeah, so that's the thing is, so design tokens are your superhero variables, right? Because they because they touch both dev and well, engineering, I'm going to call it engineering, yep. engineering and, and design. Um, so the, the, the true power of tokens is that it's, it can feed both into design and, and dev. Um, and the great thing about it is the only way that can work is that if devs and designers talk together to create a common language around exactly. how exactly. things are, are named and structured. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, when I, was, when I left NetBank, the, the kind of project that was on the go was what we call the theming engine, which was all built around tokens. Because um, in the bank, there's multiple different teams that have not necessarily the same UI or slightly different requirements. So, you know, CIB to private wealth to, um, yeah. you know, normal commercial banking, um, very different looks and feels. But the, the sort of pushback was always like, we don't want to use